thanks so much, Mark, and thank you uh, for staying here on for the final session on Sunday. Uh, one of the great things about conferences like this and gatherings like this is that we get a chance to see old friends and make new friends. And uh, particularly with old friends, there's a chance to uh, meet people who you might have read for years or, or known for years and admired their work but haven't necessarily met them before. So I remember some years ago I had the great delight of having to read about Christian scriptures in China, which was the result of a wonderful conference, and Chloe Starr is here, you know, so it's wonderful to actually be able to meet her. Uh, Ian Johnson I follow on Twitter, you know, so there's, uh, it's just a wonderful opportunity to, um, to be here with uh, old friends. And so for those of you who haven't met each other, hopefully uh, in the time remaining, you know, you can go and introduce yourself. We heard how young from Gung had uh, come along to a conference all those years ago, and it was quite influential and uh, significant for him. And uh, for those of you who study this, you know, his work is significant for us all. So it's my pleasure to be here. The brief I was given was to, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, uh, well, what's the word? Um, uh, you know, schizophrenic? You know? It, uh, it was to, on the one hand, be academic, talk about how we teach Christian history and, and Catholic history in a university setting. Uh, and then people also wanted me to talk about the challenges, the joys, you know, the, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of that. Um, which is kind of a little bit different, isn't it? That's sort of sharing versus academic. But so uh, I'll do what I can. And so uh, why don't we do this? I want to talk about this site in a minute. But what, what about first up? I show you instead of this. So this is something of what I do. Cemetery for the priests and seminarians who died on the job. Uh, what we're looking at here is one of those rare finds you can still get in China, uh, particularly in relation to the 19th and 20th century church. These are the tombstones of Jesuits who worked here uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. And uh, I was stumbling over here yesterday with some friends, it's one of those really weird things you find. And as an example, finding this bloke here. This man's huge, Leo Viaget, Leo Viaget was a translator, uh, he was a very, very learned scholarly man, he worked in this area Sien Sien for years, and um, he actually wrote on Chinese religion, and his books are all around the world, well here is his tombstone, just in this field, in the middle of Hulei. So today we're going to look at it and try and find and see what uh, other sort of delights and things we can find, and at least re record them for posterity. Okay, so uh, one of the things I love to do is, uh, as a historian, I think my role is uh, is valuing people's lives. Um, our lives matter, you know. Our stories matter. Um, who we are, you know. We only get the one shot of it, and we're all, as a as a Christian historian, as a priest. I mean, obviously, I believe that uh, you know we're all we're all loved by God, and our, our, our lives and as our lives unfold, uh, wonderful stories of engaging with our best selves becoming our best selves, and we do that through our community and, uh, and, and, and our interaction with generations past and generations to come. And so as an historian, I try to uh, honor these stories and tell these stories. As an historian of the Chinese Catholic Church, I seek to uh, tell these stories to a broader world. Uh, I seek to somehow communicate those stories to people elsewhere. Um, why? Well, I started this the sharing. Um, I, I first went to China as a schoolboy. I did language at a uh, Jesuit high school in Australia, and I loved it. And I then got a scholarship from the Australian government to go and work in, uh, to go and study Chinese immediately after my high school. And uh, you know, the study wasn't too much, but the uh, the experience of living with uh, Chinese high school friends was fantastic. Uh, I was in Beijing, and I was in Shanghai. Uh, I was there in '88 at Huarong uh, Shadao of Fujian. In, in Shanghai, and uh, my Chinese classmates just welcomed me into their lives. Um, I left China in February of 89, and you can see where this is going, and I was doing my first year university back in Australia, doing uh, Chinese language, a little bit of Aboriginal history, and statistics, and I was bored stupid by statistics, and <laughs> Tiananmen was unfolding in front of my eyes. And uh, if I knew now what I knew then, I would have asked for a, um, a special dispensation. Um, but I failed statistics because I didn't go to class. I just couldn't see the point of doing statistics. I was watching, not my friends, because my friends were in Shanghai, but people who I had known, or the equivalent of what I, you know, the place that I'd been, and 
like all of this sort of unfolding in front of my eyes. And I kind of made a bit of a promise then that whatever I would do, I would try to sort of be engaged with people from China uh, who had been so welcoming to me. And so I thought, well, I can uh, at least maybe try to tell their stories. What I find fantastic about this gathering, and I'm not going to talk for long because I think it's important we get questions, but equally it's important that we do hear from our Chinese friends. Uh, those of us who study the Chinese Catholic Church, I do it to hopefully create a space whereby the Chinese Catholic Church can actually then fill that space. Um, yeah, and so in some ways I think my, my, you know, part of my job is done, and in fact I'm finishing up at BC at the end of this year, I'm going to be director of Jesuit Mission back in Australia, which is a fundraising body for um, works in Asia Pacific. Because Look around here, people's got better language than I do, so you guys should be telling your story, you know. Um, so, bridge maker, but anyway, so other things, I then sort of came back, long story short, I did my doctorate at the Australian National University under Jeremy Barme, and he does this uh, China Heritage Quarterly, and what's fan you know, wonderful now is just the amazing uh, material that's available through such sites. He works with Jeremy Goldcorn in the <coughs> you know, dunway.org. Um, I'm sure he, John's probably right on this sort of stuff, and these sort of, uh, you know, it's just an amazing sight. And so there's so many people who are interested in China, and what he does, uh, what Jeremy Barney and China in the World do, and I'm a visiting fellow there still, is he's actually retrieving a lot of stories that have kind of been lost to uh, popular, popular understanding. So these are, this particular one is talking about some magazines in the 1930s, and they're republishing them. Because the debates, the arguments, the things that were happening at the turn of the 20th century, 19th, 20th century, are still debates and arguments that are happening now. So in a secular way, he's t sort of retrieving stories, honouring stories, telling stories, so that we can, if you like, and this is what I try to do with my students, complexify China. So China is no longer just simple, that's the way it is. We know it's not that way. We know it's very different and very um, rich and amazing and complex confusing and frustrating and, and exhilarating, and we know it's all of that. So I try and do that with my students. In terms of the church in China, I, I was, uh, in terms of academically, there's not a lot of sense being an Australian Jesuit teaching Chinese history in Boston. <laughs> well, there's a lot of Jesuit sense, we go where we're sent, you know, but I mean, there's certain sort of displacement there ultimately. Uh, and I was reminded of a, a phrase of an, an old Jesuit working in Fiji, had said he went along and he was talking about cooperatives. He was helping to form cooperatives and help local people and to improve their lives. And he went along and he said, Well, let's get your typewriter, let's work on that. And they said, Well, Father, we haven't got a typewriter. He said, Well, that's okay. Well, I mean, get your pen and get your pad and you know, get the guy who's got the educator, Father, we haven't got that. He said, What do you have? We have a pencil. He said, Well, let's begin with that. You know? I think we do what we can, when we can, to the best we can. Uh, at Boston College, they have an amazing collection of books called the Jesuitica Collection, or now and then it's called the Jesuitana Collection, which fell off the back of the um, truck from uh, uh, outside of Lyon. Where is the chocolate? What's the name of the place? Um, where the colloquy was all the time, where Ted Foster was. Show to you, this one. Um, anyway, they have this amazing collection of books, and they literally were sitting on the shelves. And I thought, this is crazy. If I had known these books were there during the course of my doctorate, I would have sort of come over and done some work. I look particularly at the 19th and 20th century church, and the video at the beginning is kind of what I love to do. Because of Richie and all the anniversaries, and because he's a Jesuit and all of that, um, there's such a focus on him. I think the real important thing, as Nicholas Standard would argue, is that it's, can we talk about the Chinese side of the equation? Can we talk about Xu Wang Qi? Can we talk about uh, Huang Ming Sha and Zhong Bing uh, Ren? You know, all these sort of Chinese legends. Um, but instead we talk about Richie. So this website, I thought, well, why don't we go beyond Richie and get some of this other material out there for the world? So what I did, I taught a class, and I got them to uh, do a lot of work with me. I mean, for instance, uh, so this website here, um, you know, it's a way I'll piece together. This is me being stupid for 54 minutes, um, celebrating, uh, you know, the 400 years of Chinese Catholic Church. So that's a video, a documentary film I made. Again, as a way of talking about the church, and so we travelled through China, myself and one other Jesuit, two Jesuits, backpacks, and a camera. And uh, so that's that movie. Um, but what I wanted to do was um, actually get a number of these fantastic books and make them available to the world. So if you're in Stockholm or Shanghai, Sydney or Sao Paulo, just to continue the S's, um, you can now actually look at all these books. And I managed to get a grant, took a lot of time. I got a lot of students to help me. Um, but basically, I mean, name a book, any book. 
Right, on that one. Very good. Um, <coughs> let's go to this one. So what we did was, every book is explained. The person who's sort of significant in this um, period of history, or well, some of them anyway, not everyone, but some of them, I talk about who they are. I also um, interconnect the different places. Each of these opens up to another page. <coughs> these are all images of either taken or taken from our books. And all for me is actually to bring people back to the book. So Confucius Sonara, Mei Jian Li, Tiapi uh, Mena, you know, just recently done a new edition of this uh, in France. But anyway, as we know, the Jesuits translated this um, over a long period of time. The final version was published here. You can actually, so this is what it looks like beautifully. It's rebound, really unfortunately. It's not the original thing. But there are two ways of doing this. You can look at this thing on your iPad, your smartphone, whatever. You can be on the tee, travelling home on the bus today, go your hardest, do whatever you like. Um, and again, you can be in Shanghai, Stockholm, whatever. You can even be in Beijing looking at this. Jiao uh, Tianmin, who's a, the um, pastor at Nanpang, I saw him last year, and he, he thanked me for making this available. He is now showing this to his, um, his, uh, his parishioners in, in Beijing. For those of you who want to get into it a little bit more deeply, we've also provided a scholarly version where you can actually come in. So this is, uh, what do they call it? It's an op, uh, op, uh, optical character recognition, OCR. The problem with OCR is that, um, so this is every page has been scanned, and it's scanned in a way that you can actually, why don't we get into it? It's scanned in a way you can actually um, search by text. So you can actually write in, let's say you want to search for Lee, as an example. Now, one of the problems about that and I frankly didn't have time, and I had to do other stuff. Um, one of the problems about that is you kind of need to know the term to put it in, and because it's the French who are doing it, you need to know the French way of um, translating the term from Chinese into Latin. You know, so it, it, it is, it's great because you can't do it, but equally there are a few. You know. <laughs> In fact, you can actually do it for it. Frater. I mean, I'm a Bonaventure would love to check Frater. You know, how many times does Frater appear? Um, Probably not that much, mate. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so you can actually do it as a as a search. Uh, if we close that one and come back to here, I think where it really sort of makes sense and it is really cool is such things as let's go to the Dual Encyclopedia. Um, this is the English translation. This was done in the uh, 17. Um, 70, it was serialized actually between 1740 and 1742. I think give or take. Don't quote me. It's a Sunday morning. And, um, but uh, what's fantastic about this book is, you know, you just let it load up, etc. You know, you, you hit your, oh, why don't we look at this? Yeah, so uh, you hit your text, expand it, and what is fascinating, scan on down until, no, right, uh, until you get, uh, oh, history comes here, we didn't want that one, we wanted the other one. Uh, anyway, the reality is there's a lot of really fantastic images that you can look at. Um, in some of these books. So, for instance, you've got the Atlas, that's got uh, the Atlas, of, that's in, again, the 18th century. So these are, that's the one. These are descriptions of China, and these books now are <coughs> freely available for the world. So they used to be in the Jesuit Library in Shanghai, then they're in the Jesuit Library at Boston College, and now, as a result of me happening to be there, and, you know, being silly, I, um, I ended up putting up these all on, online. So I think something I try to do, as I said, is share something of the stories. Um, a challenge with that, so if we move to, so that's that's a joy, that's a that's, that's a grief because it took for so long, um, you know. But it's also um, it's it's really it's wonderful. Um, the video I just showed you about those stones. Um, also, talk of something of the frustrations. Uh, so, you know, Anthony and myself, and anyone here who works as an academic, um, you know, it's it's the finding of that document. It's the finding of this tombstone, you know, this material object. This stone, when I first started, was like this, and uh, and I didn't have a lot of time. And like, I, I, my friend went and got a cup of uh, hot water for us, and we we're just drinking hot water. And I put it down there, and five minutes later, I came back. It was frozen. Um. It was just so cold. You know, and uh, and I, I ducked down there. I was meeting this friend. I had to go back. It was just in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, well, no, I want to get this. And so we stopped at the local hardware store, grabbed a shovel, grabbed some of the um, you know Chinese uh, calligraphy paper, grabbed the they couldn't have, grabbed sort of ended up some cloth and some red sort of uh, paint sort of stuff. And we did the old you know Chinese 
um, war, you know, it's not war really, it's just uh, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, you know, so fantastic image, but I thought, I want to find out who this person was, you know. Uh, who is this guy? Because these guys, some of them, two of these men, um, feature in Anthony's book about the Masters of China. Um, I don't have their photos here, unfortunately, but uh, there was um, uh, Anne Lau, uh, Paul Dexter Van Lau, and, uh, and also uh, Manga, Rene Manga. Um, these tombstones are there. So this is how it was. Uh, archaeologists would get really annoyed with me because they didn't have a lot of time, so we had to shovel and we're sort of scraping away. Um, but it would have been lost up lot. And the key thing about this is, this is a French brother who died in 1883 in, in China, in, in, this is a public province, Xianxian. He lived in the society for 30 years, and he died in China um, after living there for 20 years. And, uh, you know, this is a guy's life. This is a fellow who travelled over there and worked and did whatever he did, and he died. Now, I collected this material in uh, Christmas of 2010, and the, uh, the problem and challenge I suppose I have as an academic is, when on earth am I ever going to get to it to actually deal with this? You know, um, to actually tell these stories, because presently I'm teaching 286 students in one of my classes, and uh, that takes a bit of my time, you know? <laughs> um, so the challenge is how to be professional and be on the be on the treadmill of, of all of that, and then also how to how to spend the time with these Chinese and French and and uh, they're mostly European or Chinese. There are Chinese here as well. And these tombstones they've been stacked away. They've been somehow stored. But as you can see, the church in Sienzian at the moment these are the new tombstones, and that's what they keep clean, etc. These they just simply don't know what to do with. Uh, there are. Marcus from the Boxer Rebellion, two of whom have been canonised. Um, there is Leo Bierge, that's wonderful academic. Uh, there is uh, two bishops stones in here as well. You know, you just think, what are we doing? Now, at one level, I haven't told the government because I don't want them to um, take them away. Or I don't. You know, there are tombstones in the Yu Garden in Shanghai as well, for instance. So, there's all this wonderful history out there that I think we academics can help tell and then help the local church reclaim and take pride in and learn how to use and preserve because it's 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 uh, it's our history but uh, it's our to be sure you know it's our one with George it's our so I think uh, a challenge I have is how to do that well basically teaching 286 has done me in so like I said I'm finishing up with academics because well I mean in that way because um, you know my uh, books are out there now, so you know you can go and buy these. Um, you know, I'll still keep in writing, etc. But uh, so you know, I feel I've made like that contribution. Now my other contribution is going to be through trying to get back to the tombstones and back to people's lives. So that's a little bit of what I do, and thank you very much.